Hey, fellas, as always, please do not harass, target, bully, or dox anyone mentioned or featured in this particular video. This is merely a commentary on a recent event that took place not too long ago. That stated, let's go ahead and start the show. Somebody set up us the bot, we get signal. Main screen turn on. Receiving on. incoming transmission. How are you gentlemen? All your base are belong to us. All your base are belong to us. All your base are base to base to base All your base are belong to us. All your base are base to base to base All your base are belong to us. All your base are base to base to base All your base are belong to us. Long ago. In the earliest of days, during a time when I'd only just discovered that I was a furry. There was one place that I could go to truly express myself as the furry I was. It was always there. Always in the periphery of the sidelines, consigned to the backdrop of my browsing history. But it was there. Ready and waiting. Freely available whenever I needed it. Fur affinity. Its conception was before my time, and while I didn't truly fully understand its implementation, it stood as a bastion encapsulating all furry creativity and debauchery. As a symbol of degeneracy to the highest degree, perhaps it was just misunderstood. After all, it catered to a very specific community of artists, writers, and creatives that needed a place to go to connect with like-minded individuals in showcasing their work. Being seen as a smut-filled trash heap by others, it was routinely a target by the vain and wicked who sought to ruin the work of countless artists who have contributed to its use and operation over the years. One man stood behind it all, tending to a lonely vigil, backed only by what friends he could summon and muster as his dutiful staff. In his passing, however, a momentary weakness attracted the attention of a snot-nosed brat who decided to push his luck and make a complete ass of himself for all to see. The internet saw him as the basic bitch he was after wresting control over the site in its entirety, but he was soon found wanting and unworthy of its possession. And as the site soon found itself back in the hands of its true miners, he fled. And just as pointlessly as he had arrived, he vanished leaving no lasting impact on myself, the furry fandom, or anyone else, really. And just as soon as it had happened, the crisis was over. Almost as if it had never even happened in the first place. Furnity is back up. Furries are already uploading art, perusing galleries, following people, favoriting things, business as usual. What if it was all just a bad dream? The thought that we could lose something that stood for so long. What if the unthinkable had happened? What if the sight were to just disappear one day, like so many embers lost in the dead of night? How close were we to losing everything? Hey, hey what's going on, everybody? It's your Japan back in action, and holy shit, Fur Fanny was just hacked! <laughs> what else is new? What? You mean to tell me that the website like Fur Fanny was compromised? That the domain name brute force and swept from right under the feet of the mod staff and made off with? Nah, that would never happen in a million years. Fur affinity security is top notch, I'll have you know. You'd have better chances of breaking into Fort Knox. <laughs> no, just no. You know, Fur Affinity Security as a website has been publicly known to have been lacking for years, and it's almost become the butt of the fam's joke now, with so many DDoS attacks and security issues that have cropped up over the years. Anyway, in case you've been living under a rock, Fur Affinity was hacked the other day, but perhaps not in the way you might be thinking. I had actually started like working on a video in response while it was all happening, but the problem just sort of resolved itself by the time I had actually made any real progress on the release, so... Man, I just love it when problems resolve themselves with me having to do a damn thing. Because we YouTubers are so effective at solving real-world problems, right? Ah well, this honestly wouldn't be the first time that something happened to Fur Affinity, but this most recent hack did kind of just come out of nowhere. 
The terror lasted all about two days, and by terror, I'm sure the furry fandom was just absolutely stricken with fear. Absolutely heartbroken at the thought of losing Furrafanity as a site forever. I wouldn't doubt if a few furries actually will have to seek counseling or therapy at this point. I mean, just look at how bereaved these furries are, practically on the edge of their seats in suspense, while the whole thing was going on. What I'm more imagining is that there was a collective eye roll throughout the whole furry fandom at first hearing about the hack in the first place, shrugging their shoulders and going business as usual, right? But this time, news of the hack came with a twist. Furfanity site security wasn't actually to blame this time. Like, at all. <laughs> Well, it's just assumed that Furfinity site security is the equivalent of tying a little piece of string around a doorknob to keep it locked instead of just using the lock. Uh, Furfinity has perhaps miraculously stood the test of time and being reliable enough for regular use for nearly two decades. At least, for the most part. There was that time back in 2010 or something like that that I remember Furfinity going down for about six months' time while Dragoneer basically panhandled for donations to keep it going. But anyway... Let's just break things down into a basic tenuous timeline of events and discuss things along the way, alright? So the first sign of trouble really began on Tuesday, August 20th, 2024 at around 12.51am. So really early in the morning, about the time most people will either be going to bed or having already gone to bed. Luffy, one of the FA staff members and admins on the Discord, made a little announcement about the possibility of getting a 1016 error should you actually visit Furfinity at that time, but that they were working dutifully around the clock to rectify the issue. I guess it'd be the perfect time to try to pull a fast one on someone, like hacking a website. Um, by the way, a 1016 error means origin DNS error. This means that Cloudflare cannot resolve the origin web server's IP address. We call that foreshadowing in this business. It was by 1.59 a.m., close to 2 in the morning, that an official announcement was made stating that there was a domain hijacking attempt, as Furfinity was now redirecting to a different website. There were concerns that while the site would retain the appearance of Furfinity, it would actually be a phishing website in an attempt to gain access to various credentials. So, you know, your login, password information. So people were advised to not visit the website, let alone click on anything at this time. So between 2 o'clock a.m. early Tuesday morning, Furfinity as a website was effectively lost FA staff, who frantically spread the word to not visit the website under any circumstance as they worked to regain control. So what happened? The initial reactions by anyone not already in the know was to just assume that Furfinity as a site was hacked and to avoid the site, lest you run the risk of subjecting yourself to malware. This wasn't necessarily a real risk at any point, looking back on it, but at the time, who could tell? You know, it's always just so interesting to see the peanut gallery reacting to all this, because at the worst of it, people just kind of drew the correlation between Dragoneer's death and the fact that Furfinity was running into problems with its domain name, and that, well, the owner did just die recently, so the domain name must have expired. Which is crazy, because if it's to be believed, the domain name wasn't set to expire until January next year. And that's only if no one does anything between now and then, let alone paying the bills to keep the site up, because websites don't tend to stay up on the web for free. You kind of need an ISP to host it and a domain registrar to hold it. More on that later. Now, a friend of mine, Salem, explained it to me first that rather than Furfinity as a site being brute force or attacked directly, like I initially suspected, this was instead done by proxy. Furfinity used Network Solutions, also known as NetSoul Cares, as referenced by one of the FA staff that sought customer service as their site's registrar. It makes sense considering the fact that they're based in Herndon, Virginia, and Dragoneer has historically lived in Virginia proper. They were the company responsible for managing FA's domain name. They can be thought of as the middleman in this equation. Kind of clever on the hacker's part, they exploited a fundamental weakness regarding the credentials and could reset the password, redirecting communications like a password reset email to themselves when they request the password reset, and then getting access to the site. Sort of. More on that later. They also got access to Fur Affinities and Dragoneer's personal Twitter accounts. God damn! They wasted no time in taking direct control and making it known that something was very wrong. But that would come later. The public announcement for this came at around 8.18 that evening. 
Considering the fact that Dragoneer had already passed away by this point, dead people aren't usually in the habit of making Twitter posts, so this is obviously cause for concern and outrage for some people when it would all happen later. As far as what the hacker was doing during that span of time, it really came down to what they were doing where it was visible for all to see. Social media. More specifically, Twitter. In the beginning, they used Fur Affinity's Twitter to try and show for a specific crypto coin, Solana, acting as though this was an official endorsement from Fur Affinity for Felix as the furry mascot for the coin, using some lazily done AI artwork to try and entice furries to check it out. The website, meanwhile, began to show some unusual behavior. While it looked normal at a glance, peculiarities began to make people question whether Fur Affinity was operating normally. People pointed out that FA was a merch store now. Transactions made on the site store, if any took place, were thought to have been set up in such a way to possibly siphon money elsewhere, like that crypto coin wallet, or for the purposes of phishing. Phishing is where a hacker or third party will utilize social engineering or use of a third party program masquerading as something trustworthy looking in order to get credentials like your login information, typically your username and password, credit card info, social security number. There's a reason you're advised not to click on anything if you were ever to get a suspicious email or something like that. While all this is going on, Luffy actually tried to elicit service from NetSoul Cares, or Network Solutions if you prefer. NetSoul Cares was unable to provide assistance at that time. Their official policy is that they had to wait a full 24 to 48 hours before they could actually step in and provide proper assistance. The fuck? What does proper assistance constitute? I gotta wait two days for proper assistance to get a blowjob or something? When your bank account shows suspicious activity, what does the bank do? It freezes your account so that suspicious transactions don't happen in the first place and it can get sorted out. Netsoul Cares, meanwhile, arbitrarily states a full two days needs to pass, even though there was clear evidence of Furfinity's account being hijacked and FA staff being able to provide proof that they were the proper site owners. F.A., if you're watching this, I think you need to consider a better service provider. In any case, the site registrar wasn't going to be of assistance for the time being. Gotta wait that one to two days. What a crock of shit. As time went on, with their cryptocurrency phishing scam not really yielding the results or monetary rewards and catching on the way that they might have been hoping for, the hackers decided to make a grand spectacle of the whole thing. They dropped all pretenses of Fur Affinity behaving like business as usual to redirect it to an article. This article specifically, about three furry identifying individuals engaging in pedophilia and how they were all arrested. The implication is how little they thought of us. A fact that they'd reveal later. Back on Twitter, they seem to focus all their attention on shitposting and hating on furries. Now, whether this was genuine hatred or just baiting for attention and interaction, I can't really say. FA staff continued to try and diligently work at regaining control of the site, though because the email forwarding only forwarded to the hacker at this point, he could quickly see if any attempts were being made to reset the login credentials and mock their attempts at every turn. In trying to dunk on furries, though, he revealed the fact that he had lost about $300,000 in the whole endeavor of gaining the Fur Affinity website domain name by sharing a screenshot of a crypto wallet, which is laughably dumb, but uh, I don't think the individual ever had $300,000 to begin with, let alone $15 million in a crypto wallet. But hey, maybe he's just a millionaire's son with more money than sense. What's more likely to me is that he probably just snagged that like screenshot from Google, it wasn't really paying attention to what it was displaying. He would end up deleting the post as furries laughed at him and mocked him at every turn, which was probably the worst outcome in his mind. To this day, I honestly don't know how his self-esteem and confidence will ever recover. Now, as far as further site developments go, it would later redirect to Kiwi Farms, which is probably the kid's biggest fuck up here. Good job, kid. You done goofed. You got a site that specializes in compiling articles for the purposes of doxing people's attention. Can't see how that could possibly go wrong. The Kiwi Farmers were initially caught completely off guard as they noticed a mass influx of random ass furries that began to make their presence known on the site, with comedic calls for Nall, owner of the farms, to build the proverbial wall to keep them out. The Kiwi Farmers had no idea why all these random ass furries suddenly began showing up on their front step to bitch at them, with calls for Nall to do something about it and prepare for a mass return to center. Eventually, Nall put up a little site message matter-of-factly stating that Kiwi Farms had nothing to do with the hack, and that the offending party was just making a fool of themselves at both their expense, as this was quickly turning into a problem for both the furries and the Kiwi Farmers. 
Given their racist and transphobic nature, Kiwi farmers and furries don't typically mix well. And with so many newcomers, Kiwi farms actually had to freeze registration for the time being to prevent such a mass influx of users flooding the site. Back on Twitter, the hacker actually made a shout out to Kiwi Farms directly, going so far as to say that they would die for Kiwi Farms. Who honestly weren't all too impressed at being used as a red herring for furries, going so far as to demand a repository of logs be made available to them to evaluate. Or to fuck off. Probably to fuck off. Reason being, much of Kiwi Farms are convinced that FA staff are full of pedophiles and zoophiles, and are always interested in proof or evidence to confirm their suspicions. As no logs, deets, screenshots, or anything were made forthcoming, however, they are largely dismissive of the hacker for being a complete idiot based on their conduct online. The hacker also called upon Jim to livestream in this exchange. Jim, for those of you who don't know, refers to Mr. Medeker, who specializes in covering internet drama in a savage kind of way. Now here's where the hacker fucked up again. They actually changed the name of Furfinity's Twitter account to I Love Kiwi for Lunch, and then appeared to try deleting it. There was a very narrow window of opportunity where someone else could establish their own user handle to that of Furfinity handle before the hacker could change it back. A furry by the name of Wanos would valiantly sacrifice their own username in order to rescue that of Furfinity's from the clutches of that evil hacker. Nah, I kid. Wanos just happened to be paying attention while all this was going on and acted quickly enough to do this, getting shit on in the process by the rest of the internet and having to tell people that they weren't the hacker and that they were just doing what they thought was necessary. Presumably, they changed their account handle to Fur Affinities in order to hold it, putting the account in protected status for safekeeping. He, she, they reportedly engaged with FA staff to discuss transfer of ownership. And what reward, if any, did they request in exchange for having done this noble deed? A request for some artwork. Tis a humble enough request, don't you think? The hacker, frustrated at having lost the Fur Affinity Twitter handle, actually had the audacity to call upon Twitter support, claiming that the Twitter handle Fur Affinity had been stolen from them. What a baller! <laughs> Who does a thief call when they've been robbed from? I don't even... Anyway, I Love Kiwi for Lunch would go back to their usual nonsense, acting in tandem with other accounts in an anti-furry bent to antagonize and annoy. Like this one guy cosplaying as a follower of Islam. Inshallah, Hezbollah. Real fatherless, attention-seeking behavior here. It really didn't impress anybody at this point. Not the furries, not the kiwi farmers, anybody that was really watching, really. Made worse by the fact that while all of this was going on, he used the Dragoneer Twitter account to repost some private DMs that were admittedly embarrassing, but ultimately harmless. It was just incredibly disrespectful to do so at Dragoneer's expense, and even seen as sacrilegious, serving no real purpose other than to emphasize the fact that this kid was an all-around piece of shit. Even some of the kiwi farmers couldn't help but lament that this was low, even by their standards. Bear in mind, the farms aren't some hive mind of animosity, but I think it's safe to assume most of it is, with others undoubtedly looking forward to this being the end of FA. Others still saw this as a rare opportunity to get some real materials here, like DMs, private communications between staffers, notes, anything of the sort. Unfortunately for them, no such materials would ever be forthcoming. When the fact that Dragoneer had passed away was pointed out in post to the hacker, the hacker claimed they had no idea that Dragoneer was even dead. Slight correction here, and something I'd like to point out as I finish editing this video. Uh, so I foolishly referenced them not knowing Dragoneer was already dead a few times during this video. The hacker makes this declaration that they'll stop posting on Dragoneer's Twitter account because he's dead which I initially interpreted as them possibly not knowing that fact, with others having to point that out to them, but I'm starting to think it's more likely they already knew and only stopped to save face when they realized how much of a piece of shit it made them look like when others had to point out that they crossed the line. It's a weird consideration to make considering the kinds of things they've been saying and doing up to this point, but, you know, I figure I might as well make that declaration now. And then proceeded to go right back to being a shithead. In any case, it was a really bad look for all concerned. As far as the website goes, it really wasn't until late Tuesday night that most ISPs had received reports that the site was possibly being utilized for the purposes of phishing. So you get one of these screens if you actually tried accessing Fur Affinity on your own. Womp, womp. 
Now, it's worth pointing out that during all of this, the GoFundMe set up for honoring Dragonair's memory had been horribly disrupted and forced Skiggles to put the entire thing on lockdown for that moment. Though it's supposedly safe. Skiggles, still being F.A. staff, was just exasperated from the whole ordeal and asked that people cut her some slack and have patience in the fact that she was genuinely trying to rectify the situation and doing the best that she could, of which I have no doubt. Having to face the death of her ex-husband and all this bullshit regarding one of the biggest furry websites in all the fandom in the time span of less than a month's time is probably not something she was looking forward to, so I wish her well. At around 11 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday, August 21st, 2024, it would be publicly announced that Fur Affinity was back in F.A. staff hands and placed on lockdown for review before coming back online. <laughs> Fur Affinity live, baby! While it would take a little time to restore the site to normal function after a thorough review to ensure no malicious activities had taken place during the time it wasn't in their direct control, the turnaround time was fairly quick, with site operation business as usual within a day's time. Now, I'm assuming that Soulcare's finally got off their lazy asses and actually stepped in to help, as it had already been about 24 hours plus by that point. Details were scarce apart from the fact that the tech team had regained control of the site, but it would be later revealed by Xanakar that FA staff actually met with Netsoulcares for a period of about several hours, and after what must have been a painful ass meeting, finally agreed to lock the account or revert the changes made to the domain name's registrar. Apparently, a fraud investigation had also been initiated by Netsoulcares. I love Kiwi for lunch as a user handle would actually later be taken by two coats who laughed about it, as I'm sure others would as soon as they were aware, so Kiwi for lunch was now effectively gone as a threat and annoyance. As for Kiwi Farms, it generated a lot of controversy internally, with a lot of users just kind of speculating as to who it could have been and doing what they do best, shitting on furries. Now, it's been suggested that various furries have actually attacked Kiwi Farms after the fact through a series of DDoS attacks, presumably in retaliation for the perceived slight and the fact that many hold them responsible for the attack from an affiliate hacker. Ever since the Keffel's kerfluffle, however, Nala has taken a very hands-on approach at ensuring site security, and apart from maybe a slight disturbance or two, this retaliatory action did little, if anything. The crisis was over and everyone involved could now go back to living their lives in peace. Ha! <laughs> Fat chance of that! So now that the crisis has truly passed, who done it? Who was the piss pants kid that wasted all our time? Well... I don't know. Based entirely on their conduct online and what they did, the consensus points to Uberlead Hacker Bro at best being a wannabe crypto bro turned script kitty that got lucky. Not because they showcased their skills and abilities as a hacker, but in having exploited such a soft target, i.e. a site registrar third party service, Netsoul Cares, and Netsoul Cares having such shitty security to begin with. Their half-assed attempt at shilling for their desired crypto coin, Solana, indicates that while the motive appeared to have been monetary gain at first, this very quickly turned into attention-seeking behavior and trying to find affirmation and validation from others online when they began engaging with people more directly on Twitter, calling out furries as pedophiles and zoophiles as if doing this on a moral basis. So clearly a troll, one who thought they were being funny and cute, but nobody was really laughing. Not the kiwi farmers, not the furries, and certainly not any of the other people online. Why he'd waste a lot of his time ardently criticizing furries at every turn, saying that we'd get what we deserve soon. It's difficult to determine if they actually hated furries as much as they said they did, or if they were being so critical of furries not because that's how they really felt, but rather to seek affirmation and respect from the rest of the online space. They just didn't seem to know when to quit. Their posts honestly just came off as obnoxiously pretentious and trying to act so cool without actually being cool, like, at all. Copious use of slang and the n-word was the order of the day, like he's down bad and in with everyone watching. What he didn't seem to realize was that everyone was either laughing or just shaking their heads at how pathetic he was. It'd be funny if it weren't so pathetic. See guys, I hate furries even more than you guys do, therefore I must be one of the cool kids club. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if they're a Ruben Sim fan, because they recited the same tired anti-furry jargon, assumptions, and assertions in their engagement with the furries on Twitter. In conjunction with other accounts, be they actual people or just burner gimmick accounts owned by them, he'd make fun of furries in increasingly stupid ways, 
Given the fact that they spent so much time on Twitter, they clearly had a lot of time on their hands. The only question is, why? Why all this needless aggravation and annoyance? Attention-seeking behavior doesn't need a reason, I guess, because he did seem, like, hell-bent on getting as much interaction as possible with random-ass furries online. Congrats! You inconvenienced a bunch of random-ass people you don't even know. I hope you're happy with yourself. Now, people have claimed and insist that they had actually doxed themselves while all of this was going on, which I seriously doubt. I recall that they kept posting pictures of a variety of different people to divert attention away from their true identity, like Ethan Ralph when he was younger, which became really weird when he posts more recent pictures and videos of Ralph being older. When people questioned this discrepancy, the hacker insisted they're only 19 years old, and they only look old. Given how they've been acting online, I have no reason to doubt they're only 19 years of age, even though they really only act their shoe size. His incompetence was on full display when he lost the original Twitter account by being a complete idiot, then had the audacity to claim that it had been stolen from him when he couldn't get it back. Like I said before, when the thief gets robbed from, more at 11. Now, some internet sleuths actually decided to undertake a sort of investigation during all of this, though the efficacy of their findings is questionable, to say the least. While all of this was going on, people would go on to claim that a supposed furry, non-furry by the name of Zori did it, based entirely on flaky circumstantial evidence. Zori committed the cardinal sin of replying to some of Furafini's tweets while Furafini's Twitter account had been compromised. Clearly, Zori was involved in some way, shape, or form, at least in their eyes. Now, if that's the case, then just about anybody who interacted with Furfinity's compromised Twitter account would be suspect at this point. Zori denied the allegation straight up, by the way. So that didn't really go anywhere. Null Bulge, or Null Bulge Group, whichever you prefer, draws a correlation with a suspicious flag being used by an individual named Ploopy, or Lahonk. They appear to be French, possibly even French-Canadian. They basically drew the dots that, because of the flag, because they like anime and AI art, and somehow link their Reddit account to the fact that there's a Kiwis of Harm account that uses the very same flag as Jap, that therefore, Ploopy is somehow the hacker, case closed. They even made this wonderful collage picture as their evidence. Let's take a look at it together. Now, looking at the first attachment, this honestly plays off as a grand mal seizure, as you're just inundated with what looks like a conspiracy theorist playboard. Though, as you continue to look, your eyes are obviously drawn to the red letter text emphasizing the correlation here. Anime plus AI plus linked to the Reddit account, Lahonk aka Ploopy appears to be a Linux user, and made that flag as a response to how Linux users see Windows users, presumably. I'm just guessing here, by the way. Um, and Shap appears to use a Linux virtual machine, as certain details of their post seem different. Nullbulge appears to have put an autistic level of attention into the timing of it all. Timing of their posts, timing that something's mentioned, timing of something that appears, and correlating them with Kaiserreich on Reddit. Now, I'm seeing some weird alt-righty posts here, like the Wojak Chud gremlins down there, some posts like, Sorry, Chud. We just made the arbitrary decision that gender is a social construct, so over the course of the next five years, we're going to upend thousands of years of civilization by completely destroying the foundational concept of biological gender. Also, we will normalize raping children with... Dot, dot, dot. That doesn't sound like something LaHonk would necessarily say, but hey, maybe I just don't know them all that well. It's definitely something that NS Chat posts on the farms, though. Now, they also include a Twitter user by the name of Ryan Wang, aka Relagtive for some reason, who just happens to have mentioned about having a nightmare of Linux, and just happens to play Roblox, who just happens to have gone to Pierre Elliott Trudeau High School while living in Markham, Ontario. Markham, Ontario is a common thread between all three, it's been suggested. Ryan Wang has become aware of this post and politely asked that they not be included in any of this nonsense, as Twitter users continue to harass them, so please don't bother them all right this this is an official statement from me to you don't bother them so not only is this just two people ploopy and s chat but actually three people now with ryan wang now involved the way that the three post and type just appears a little bit different so that they all definitely appear to be three separate people that just happen to maybe hail from markham ontario and, you know, Mark Mentario, I'll look up the stats later, but I'm pretty sure there's more than just three people that live there. 
Now, even if they're the same person, though, I'm still not seeing anything that would suggest any kind of, like, a hack or a confession or anything like that. Nothing here really seems to suggest that any of these people actually hacked for affinity. Let's see if this changes with the second post, though. Oh, here we go. It says, little proof of being the hacker in red lettering. Clearly, this is the evidence we're so desperately needing here. Lots and lots of focus on timing here. And a Twitter post by Tyler McFucker that something is happening. Give me time. I'm back from watching and back to work. Kiwi Farms is such a vile site. We literally helped your community expose Kira the Wolf and arrest his buddies. Yeah, I remember those days. Anime Girl, Linux, Virtual Machine Talk. They admit that they're a Reddit user, so that's nice. Ploopy herself seems to describe herself as a local geeky cat girl, computer nerd that sucks at video games. And that programming makes her head hurt. Me too. They self-identify as Asian, though. But a little bit of a self-hating one at that. They're not so much Asian, but they're B-Asian, apparently. I'm seeing a Roblox screen cap down there towards the bottom with the, sorry, was busy playing Roblox tweet, and nothing here to really suggest a confession or a claim that either of them hacked the site. So if this was evidence to be taken to court, I'm pretty sure the judge would laugh your ass right off the stand. <laughs> Time Zones, Canada, more specifically Markham, Ontario, that flag, alt-right shitposting, anime, AI art, artificial intelligence stuff, Linux, and specific times appear to have been the interwoven thread to make all of this rich tapestry of cringe. Needless to say, I'm not the only person that kind of looked at all this and was just kind of like, this ain't it, chief. Ploopy was consulted over Discord and seemed legitimately baffled at the suggestion, so while it could have been them, the evidence is tenuous at best. Ploopy is French, maybe even French-Canadian. They're an anime enthusiast, trans woman, trans girl that made the flag as a meme a while ago, as in years ago, if they're to be believed. And his chat, meanwhile, is a Kiwi Farms user that joined the site back in 2019. The connection between the two is tenuous at best, with the fact that NS Chap just happens to have set their icon picture as a flag, with little else really suggesting that they're the same person, and no evidence presented that they were responsible for the hack in the first place. Man, imagine the idea that you're just some kid, and you wake up one day to your friend telling you that the internet thinks that you hacked the biggest furry website of all time just because you made a stupid meme years ago. Man, that's gotta suck. As to how I know all this, another French Canadian, question mark, question mark, uh, by the name of Fortism2 actually approached them over Discord to question them about it. Fortism2 was shocked when they saw the tweet in the first place, stating that they were in her class five years ago, and managed to reach out over Discord to confirm. Why they decided to make their DMs public knowledge is kind of a head scratcher, but they insist that Ploopy isn't responsible because Ploopy said they didn't do it. Well, if Ploopy says they didn't do it, then it must be true. But no, seriously, th there's nothing to really suggest that Ploopy did anything, other than that vaguely Nazi-ass flag that they made that NS Chap now uses. At this point, I could just as easily accuse Nullbulge of all this and trying to pin it on Ploopy as a convenient scapegoat. As for Nullbulge's credentials, they're allegedly a hacker group, but supposedly it's really just one dude claiming to be a group. Nullbulge themselves, they're an uberlete hacker bro, or so they claim. Uh, Kiwi Farms did them a solid and doxed them, which I will not be going into the details of, but I can't really say I'm all too impressed. Null, by the way, as far as the head administrator and owner of the Kiwi Farms, has no relation to Nullbulge, by the way. Nullbulge, as a name, obviously refers to a specific deprivation kink, where you're basically deprived access to your, um, bulgy walgy, usually behind a veil of latex. Anyway, the two I can confirm are separate people. It's been pointed out that the more likely cause for suspicion here was because Nullbulge appears to have a little bit of a hate boner for all things AI or artificial intelligence generated art, which Ploopy may have been guilty of at some point. Given that Null likes to scan through those engaging in the use of or spreading of AI art, the presence of the flag and the fact that Ploopy made it in the first place might have triggered a biased response in digging in too deep at the idea that Ploopy and NSJAP were the same person. Even if that were the case, how that would substantiate the idea that this ploopy NS Jap person hacked for affinity in the first place, or more accurately compromised its main registrar, remains to be seen. 
He seems to have smartened up because his original post was deleted after people began poking holes in his theory. So the two suspects pulled out of thin air. Zori and Ploopy are out as unlikely suspects. It remains to be seen if any concrete evidence surfaces that points to who our mysterious script kitty was, or if any real repercussions will be happening in their lives in the near future. Although, wait, I know who did it. It was Sam Hyde all along. That cheeky bastard. Only one man would have had the motive, the opportunity, and the know-how to pull off such a harebrained scheme in the first place and then disappear right after the fact. With a track record of hundreds upon thousands of mass shootings under his belt, hacking for affinity would have been the least of our worries. In all seriousness, FA staff has alluded to the idea that they might know who did it, but with so many different sources claiming to have identified the suspect, there's no way to know for sure. So they'll just let the FBI take care of it. I'm sure they'll take this super serially. For sure. Now, something very interesting that I sort of just glossed over initially is the fact that Skiggles had revealed something very interesting in her update post regarding Dragoneer's GoFundMe. I'm not sure if it's indicative of something way deeper that could completely change her understanding of the whole situation in its entirety, but look at these last few sentences here. No, it wasn't as simple as someone having a password. It was done maliciously using very personal information and fraud. This is to emphasize the difficulty in convincing NetSoul Cares that she and the other FA mods were the true and rightful owners of Furfini and trying to prompt them to intervene. Very personal information and fraud. Very personal information that the hacker presumably was either privy to or had leaked to them by either a current or former mod staffer then, maybe? This really gets into conspiracy theory territory, by the way, but people have floated the idea as a possibility, from both sides, that there could potentially be a mole in the admin group in FA. My biggest criticism of Dragoneer as an individual, more on that in another video, is the fact that Dragoneer associated with some pretty dastardly, bastardly individuals as his friends over the years. He didn't always vet people or have moral objections to their less pleasant modes of character in either associating with them or bringing them on as a mod or staff on the site. All due respect to him, by the way, but it is something that I'd noticed that would mar his reputation along the way. I float this as a possibility now, thinking about all of this. Could it be that someone in his absence that just so happened to have access to some pertinent information decided to take control of the site, or more accurately, the ability in redirecting site traffic, convince the public that some idiot script kitty crypto bro wannabe had taken not only the site's domain name, but also the Fur Affinity Twitter and Dragoneer's personal Twitter accounts, and was just having a laugh at the furry fam's expense while also involving the kiwi farmers into the mix as a red herring while also seemingly trying to curry favor with them, in spite of the fact that they clearly held them at arm's length? Kiwi Farmers admitted to trying to DM them more directly over Twitter, only to get ignored. Was this all just an act? Notice when they use the N-word, they always end it with an A rather than the hard R. As if that somehow makes it all better. Could this have all just been an elaborate act to make it seem like some independent actor was playing a bit? Not sure why they transitioned from furry hate to right-wing conservative bullshit, though. In any case, some random kid managing to pull this off completely on their own and completely out of the blue just seems unlikely if a disenfranchised staff member could just as easily have either leaked it for the goofs and gaffs of it, or was acting far more maliciously to try to get to Skiggles or the other FA staffers. Based on their behavior on social media, though, either it was an elaborate act in which they made themselves out to be a caricature of a typical furry-hating Rubensim fan, or it was just a Rubensim fan themselves. Where does the truth lie? You decide, because I already have. The reasoning here would be as a big fuck you to their peers, and in rattling the fandom's proverbial cage, because we all know that the biggest furry haters out there are other furries, with a vendetta. In all seriousness, though, I'd be interested if more information arises. Now, the Kiwi Farmers have also touched on this possibility, but from a far more biased sort of perspective. Anything from a gay op to a false flag operation to the detriment of Kiwi Farms. I don't think Kiwi Farms was being targeted so much as they were just being used as a convenient fall guy before the narrative turned into a fan of Kiwi Farms playing to their tune and trying to curry favor with them, which obviously failed. 
One seems to imply that this was sort of a publicity stunt to get more donations for not only the site, but also Dragoneer's GoFundMe. Which is kind of in poor taste, if you ask me, to suggest that, and a gross misrepresentation of the situation, but I guess I can get that vibe from an outside observer's perspective. Furfe needs your help. Oh shit, it just got hacked. Better donate more money to keep it going, because money makes, keeps the world going round. Dragoneer died with debts in his name, having given a lot to keep Furfandy running. So his death brought all that to light, not to mention that his family is actively being helped in this exchange with that money, and we haven't even touched on a funeral for him. That's going to cost money too. I don't think it's fair to think of it in that light, but Kiwi Farmers already have a considerably low opinion of us to begin with, so I'm really not surprised. I'm gonna give you all a rare opportunity to decide which way this video goes from here. If you think this is all somehow staged to look a certain way and there's way more going on here behind the scenes with FA staff that might have led up to all this, you can go ahead and end this video right here. We'll go ahead and call it a day. If you think the hacker really is just some snot-nosed brat script kitty Ruben Sim stand that got lucky, with nothing else going on here in the background, go ahead and continue playing. I won't tell nobody. It'll be our little secret. So really, while the whole situation freaked a lot of people out, it was kind of overblown and very short-lived. Less than two days. Most drama on Twitter or other forms of social media seems to last for about a week at least. Maybe even several weeks, depending on how deep the rabbit hole goes. But in this case, it all obviously centered around Fur Affinity being held hostage by a dipshit troll who wanted little attention. But when the site was operating normally, all of that kind of faded away into the ether. While the timing was very bad, and kind of suspicious, just a few weeks after it was announced that Dragoneer had already met his untimely demise, it's supposedly just a mere coincidence. If it can be believed from the hacker's side of things, they had no idea Dragoneer was even dead in the first place. Again, slight correction here, I'm now convinced the hacker already knew that Dragoneer was dead, and acted with complete and reckless abandon, but I guess to try to save face and not seem like a total piece of shit, stop voluntarily of their own free will while still insisting that Dragoneer was a pedophile, as most furries were in their eyes. Or so they claimed if this wasn't just an act. Makes sense why furries would be the least bit suspicious, though. Fur Affinity as a site being deeply unpopular with anti-furries that would sooner like to see it gone, and the site's long-standing defender now gone too, to try to exploit that weakness now would probably be the best possible time. But the hacker wasn't even really a hacker. At best, he was a wannabe crypto bro script kitty who got lucky. I'll still be referring to them as a hacker for the rest of this video, but just know that they didn't really hack anything. It would become readily apparent that the hacker didn't have access to anything truly important, beyond the ability to redirect site traffic. While the hacker claimed that they had access to oodles and oodles of horrible things like oh-so-private communications, logs, notes, messages, proving that there was horrible stuff going on, there's no evidence that the Uberlite hacker even got access to FA as a site, or the information from the site to begin with. No evidence has surfaced of debauchery or wickedness other than some embarrassing DMs between Dragoneer and others, which was entirely on Twitter and centered entirely on porn. So really, adults being adults. All they did throughout all of this that would suggest a hack was compromise the site's registrar under DNS management, which would suggest that Network Solutions got some explaining to do beyond do better next time. While he seemed intent on redirecting site traffic to the merch store for the purposes of phishing, possibly siphoning money elsewhere should transactions actually take place, that obviously didn't really yield much in the way of fruit, as Furry seemed to already know better by that point. So then he redirected traffic to a news article about the three furries engaging in pedophilia and getting arrested for it, and then redirecting that to the site Kiwi Farms after that. That was like poking the hornet's nest. The reason I'm going over all this again is because I'm not sure if the initial intent was to use kiwi farms as a red herring to divert suspicion away from themselves onto the kiwi farmers, but if that was the desired effect, it worked, if briefly, as furries initially suspected a rogue kiwi farmer or affiliate quote-unquote hacker had hacked the site. This suspicion went right out the window when the hacker was dumb enough to sort of confirm that Kiwi Farmers didn't really do this when they gave them a shout out as though they were a fan, calling upon Jim to livestream to talk about the whole thing. 
As far as the hacker's activities, the hackers seem more concerned with shitposting and antagonizing people rather than doing anything of real substance, like leaking notes or private communications, anything like that. At least regarding the site. The Kiwi Farmers were simultaneously shitting on and demanding things like logs, leaks, screenshots, some sort of a confirmation of wrongdoing and debauchery undertaken by FA staff, of which they already have low opinion of. So for as long a time, relatively speaking, as they had access not only to the site's domain name, but the Twitter accounts as well, you'd think he'd have made better use of his time. Maybe try hacking the site itself to attain private information or something of value, or evidence of debauchery in the DMs, or other materials they could try to get access to, but he couldn't even do that. Maybe even a half-ass attempt at holding the site's domain name hostage for the payment of ransom. Not that I would want this outcome, by the way, but at least it would have served more of a purpose over the bullshit he was spewing on social media. So really, he didn't accomplish anything meaningful, but wasted time of FA staff in trying to rectify the issue and stressing people out, piss people off, and insulted the collective intelligence of both furries and kiwi farmers alike. Imagine pissing off two diametrically opposed groups, furries and kiwi farmers. Both would end up hating this guy to the max. Furries for the disparaging nature of the shitposting, not to mention sullying Dragoneer's name and kicking the guy's memory while he was already down. Kiwi farmers for including them in all this nonsense to begin with at their expense. Both sides couldn't help but come to the conclusion that... Oh brother, this guy stinks! As for the hacker, what they did would be considered highly illegal, and what's probably going to happen is it's probably going to be tracked back to them, and anyone in any official capacity on Fur Affinity site staff will likely be pressing charges for the disruption and the security breach to begin with. That's if they're ever even caught in the first place. It's entirely possible they just melt back into the online space without any meaningful repercussions actually happening to them. But who knows? Maybe they'll get a knock on the door months later by the cyber police, connect the dots, and follow the trail leading back to them. I can't imagine this guy was all that careful or smart covering up their tracks and carrying out this cockamamie bullshit scheme to begin with. FA staff have already stated their intentions in working with the FBI, and that Soul Cares has initiated their own investigation of the matter. So it's really a question of, will the FBI give enough of a shit about a furry image board website and how competent Net Soul Cares is in procuring information that will lead back to the hacker? I'm not holding my breath in either case, honestly. Honestly, we're lucky that the Uberlite hacker was such an incompetent boob. Though, if someone with a real agenda broke in, kept quiet about their intrusion, and began leaking private notes or data, or began working towards something big, who knows what could happen? Users of the site could find their usernames had been stolen without their knowledge. Whole galleries could be deleted one after the other in rapid succession. The site could just disappear one day. The source code horribly corrupted. The proliferation of malware pushed onto those visiting the site. Data lost, permanently. Any number of things could have happened. Might have forced Fur Affinity to start over again if it were bad enough. Who knows? Perhaps this is sort of a wake-up call for all parties concerned. But because the fault lies with Network Solutions, or Net Soul Cares, whichever you prefer, um... They better up their game, or Skiggles and FA staff should probably find a new domain registrar. The fact that they could get into both Dragoneer's and Fur Affinity's official Twitter accounts, though, would suggest that the same password email address had been used for all three. Presumably Dragoneer's. I initially suspected that Dragoneer used the same password for all three. Which would have been hilariously incompetent on his part. So we have the combination. Great! What's the combination? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. That's amazing. I've got the same combination on my luggage. <laughs> Bruh. But I'm starting to think that that's not the case. Though, would it really surprise anyone if it were? In any case, always remember to keep your passwords different for each of the accounts you maintain on a website, service, app, whatever. The idea is that if one gets compromised, at least the others won't go along with it. As for Skiggles and the rest of the FA staff, namely Luffy and Xanakar, and others, 
I have to congratulate them for taking this whole situation seriously and making the effort to spread the word at the first sign of trouble. They were very transparent with what had happened during and after the whole thing unfolded, and generally seemed more concerned with safeguarding their users than just keeping quiet about the whole thing to avoid looking bad in the face of a crisis. So good on them. While most people were simply just watching and waiting, some people were legitimately impacted insofar as being stressed the fuck out and worried about the future of Fur Affinity as a website. Artists that rely on commissions to put food on the table and a roof over their head were concerned about how long this outage was going to go on for. If this is going to be an ongoing issue, how feasible is it to base one's entire business model around a site that has had a history of security issues? Constant disruptions are not conducive to running a business, after all. Think about how many artists and customers had stood to be impacted by all this. Think about the anxiety and stress this would cause anyone under normal circumstances. We are so lucky this only lasts about two days time. Imagine if it were months upon months like back in 2010. Moral of the story? Maybe don't be a shitty person to random ass people online you don't even know just because they're a little different from you. And if you're an artist, creative, or were somehow affected by all this, maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket, alright? It was impressed upon me by friends that the expectation of artists and their customers to always have fur affinity to have their back, to showcase their galleries of art and be a means of running a business, is unrealistic at best, as anything could happen to fur affinity at large, so it never hurts to have a contingency plan in place, or to establish and maintain multiple accounts elsewhere in the event that something like this would ever happen again. In Fur Affinity's case, lightning does in fact strike twice. Alternatives do exist, by the way, and while they might differ in some regards or lack the same reach that Fur Affinity has, they do fulfill some of the same basic needs that Fur Affinity does. There's a reason that people, artists in particular, have a Twitter or a Blue Sky to advertise their artwork on or to connect with people through. While I was and still am an avid user of Fur Affinity and all that it has to offer, in the event that Fur Affinity were ever truly compromised, as in permanently, alternatives thankfully do exist. You got SoFurry, Sheezyart, Weasel, Twitter, Blue Sky, maybe even DeviantArt. I'd honestly steer clear of Inkbunny though. I stopped using it years ago after it got flooded by cub fur enthusiasts migrating over from Fur Affinity when FA instituted their shift in rules so as to not piss off their payment processors. Now, if that's too many websites to easily manage on your own, multiple services like Postyburb do exist, so that something like a picture or a post can be posted at the same time on multiple different websites. You might have seen reference to the service in some submissions on FA. Now, the likelihood of Fur Affinity being wiped off the face of the internet was thankfully low to practically non-existent in this case. But hey, anything could happen in the future, right? The downage also highlights Fur Affinity's need for your support. There are a lot of costs associated with running a website, and given the fact that Fur Affinity's owner and largest contributor had recently passed away with debts in his name, if you give a shit about the site, why not drop a couple of bucks in the till so we can keep it going? Yeah? Yeah? Fur Affinity's been there for you. Why not be there for it? I want you to support Burfane. In any case, the entire endeavor turned out to be a massive waste of time for all parties involved, and was an unnecessary inconvenience for FA staff to contend with. It highlighted the subpar security surrounding Fur Affinity's domain registrar, and that, should this happen again in the future, heavens fucking forbid how unhelpful Sunet Soul Cares was in this situation, which might prompt them to seek a better service provider. As for the rest of the furry fandom is concerned, it's just one more notch in Fur Affinity's belt as an incident that the site sustained during its operations, but this time, not its fault, or at least a fault in the site or its coding, thankfully. I'm thankful that a lot of people got to see it happen in real time and were aware that it was happening in the first place, though that didn't stop the spread of misinformation or from taking place on forums, sites, social media, or even by word of mouth. As for why any of this had to happen in the first place, I don't know. I guess it comes down to the inability of some people to well enough just leave shit alone. Let alone let people go about living their everyday lives. It's the internet after all. The live and let live principle need not apply here. No matter what the fuck you do, or what the fuck you say, someone's gonna take issue with that. Whether it's to smugly lord their opinion over yours and act like they're better than you, or to target you for the fun of it with kecks and laughs along the way and harassing you, to outright hating you for all you stand for and hold near and dear. People have a license to be needlessly mean-spirited and cruel online, with the sense of anonymity giving them the courage to say or do things they wouldn't normally say or do. 
Now with that in mind, it feels like, and this is just a feeling, in recent years, furry hate has seen a little bit of an uptick. As in, people needlessly hating on furries with the very core of their being, just for the sake of it. The kiwi farmers are a small subset of that, though they generally have better reasons for it than others do. There are many more out there that just don't really have a good reason for it. Furries are mainstream enough that a lot of people are aware of their existence. They know what they are, who they are, what they're all about, what they're into. But then you get pretentious shitheads like Ruben Sim who decided to base his entire existence online, stroking his own ego while stoking the flames of hatred to give him cause other than making shitty Roblox content. So inspiring kids to hate on furries because it's okay to hate on furries. They exist to be hated on. They're different. They're all pedophiles and zoophiles. And even if they're not, there's enough of them in the fandom that are, so it doesn't even matter if they are or not. I hate them with every core of my being. Grr, fuck those furries. Now in Script Key's case, their posts lack the sting or reach to royally piss me off or make me feel bad or feel threatened and came off more like a desperate attempt to look cool in the eyes of the rest of the internet. Kind of like when they made that shout out to Kiwi Farms, called out to Jim, the way they engaged with others, the substance of their posts, acting like they were hot shit in a bag of chips when they were anything but. You're probably wondering why you're here. You're here because you done f***ed up too many times. You think you're hot in a champagne glass, but you're really cold diarrhea in a Dixie cup. And if you keep up like you've been doing, this is where you're headed. Hey, I'm hating on furries like you guys already do. Look at me. Look at me. I'm cool like you. So jumping on the I hate furries bandwagon and a sorry attempt at gaining respect from their peers for it. Nothing they said was even all that original, almost like they'd heard it from somewhere else before and decided to parrot it now that they had the internet's attention. Now, some are smart enough to dismiss this for what it was, attention-seeking behavior, interaction farming, whatever you want to call it, but I don't think they quite saw it from my angle. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time I encountered a kid that hated on furries by principle or for the meme of it. And using that as an excuse to give them license for harassing, bullying, insulting them. If that's really the case here, then that's just sad and pathetic. If it's not, I can only wonder how sad and pathetic this dude's life is, and how they waste their time shitposting and grabbing at such low-hanging fruit. I guess it's okay. As in, there's nothing I can really do about it at this point, right? I can't even blame Ruben Sim for this, even if the hacker script cave bro were a Ruben Sim fan. He doesn't necessarily control the actions of those that are into him or follow him. But this whole backdrop of needless hate just has become so annoying and entirely unnecessary at the end of the day. Benefiting from hating on furries. Aw oh, man. Based. In his case, though, it doesn't distract me from the fact that he's an aging man-child who's bald and seems to capitalize on being adored by packs of children that eat his content up like shit. Must make him feel really big and important when he targets random-ass furries and indirectly sends his hordes of adoring fans after them to bully them right off of Roblox. But only tangentially related to this video in terms of facilitating this kind of hatred. Let the hate flow through you. You're not helping. More on that in another video. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a denomination of younger people that have historically bore witness to or listened to those people that they were either a fan of or looked up to in some meaningful way, hating on furries, and it's created a denomination of people that hate furries. Not because furries actually did something to them, or because their behaviors collectively offend their belief system in some way, but just cause. They don't get it. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of legitimate criticisms of the furry fandom, or furries in general, I can make to understand why some people hate them. It's definitely not for everyone, but just hating random people for the sake of hating on them without any real purpose behind it, even Ruben Sim's most ardent fans have told him, dude, dude, Ruben, we hear you, but can you shut the fuck up about furries for like five minutes, man? Thanks. Almost like furries just exist to be hated upon. So whatever happens to them on an individualized basis or as a furry fandom at large is entirely okay in their eyes because of the simple fact that the victim of whatever said to or done to is a furry. Who's gonna care? The rest of the internet? Fat fucking chance of that! Why was Furfinity targeted in this hacking attempt in the first place with this hacker acting so casually brazen about the whole thing just to hate on furries all the while they made their crime known? 
You know, those people who genuinely hate furries tend to avoid them completely, or get rid of them where they can. But furry haters like these spend an awful lot of time interacting with the very thing that they hate, so what does that say about them? Either way, I guess none of this really matters at the end of the day. For Affinity Safe, for now, you can all rejoice in that fact and go on home. Me, well, I still got a lot of catching up to do before we can really resume business as usual on the channel. But I was at least invested enough in this situation and sort of covered it in its entirety. So at least there's that. Man, I got so many fucking videos to work on. Anyway, till next time, boys and girls, take care and peace. I hope you all have a better one. I guess we're back.